In this video, I'm going to be interviewing Sanjog Sandhu from the United Kingdom, and we're going to be discussing his experience of learning to employ the jump. Sanjog first got in touch with me about five months ago by email, and his reason for doing so was to request some extra help and feedback. Since then, we've been exchanging messages and have also set up an interactive WhatsApp group called Jump Squad. The Jump is a method that the, Stam that the Stammering Self-Empowerment Programme teaches to help you to start moving forward again when you find yourself blocking on the sound without having to resort to the use of force. So welcome, Sanjog, <coughs> and um, I'll, I'll go straight into the interview. Um, and I want to start by asking you to tell us a little bit about your, your background uh, and also your stuttering history. Sure, and, and, and just want to say thank you for, for doing the interview as well. Um, so my background is I am I'm, I'm currently 29 years old. I was born in the UK. My, my parents are Indian. Um, I, so so my, 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 my current job is I am helping my, my mum to open up a, an ophthalmology clinic near the High Wycombe area. So, so I'm, I'm in charge of the business side of things, um, hiring people, sorting out the property lease, equipment, stuff like that. And, and he's the eye surgeon, so she's doing the medical side of things. My stuttering history. Wow, <laughs> that, that's quite a broad question. So I started stuttering age five. <clears throat> Between the ages of two and five, I was speaking perfectly fluently. And then I started to stumble over my words and my parents noticed. Um, I, I remember a few incidences when I was really young where people would say, slow down, or the, they would comment on the fact that I was speaking abnormally. So as I got older, I started noticing, oh, I'm different from everybody else. I speak differently. Uh, something must be wrong with me. As I moved throughout school, I had more and more negative experiences. So maybe a, a kid would point out in class and the whole class would notice, or at least I, that was my perception of it. Um, had a few instances, instances where kids would laugh. So I, I learned that stuttering was something that was quite negative and I learned to hide it by uh, avoiding just everything. I just everything. So I remember avoiding more and more and more as I got older and older and older. I would often not really state an, an a, a opinion of mine if it was different from everybody else's. I would often blend into the background just, and, and this was especially in group conversations, if, if, if people were just bouncing around the group, I'd play it very safe and only jump in with a joke on the back end of someone else. Right. I would never initiate a new topic of conversation, ever. Uh, and I, I would never initiate a joke. I would just always tail end, tail end. And that was my safety blanket. Could I just ask you there, um, your main stuttering symptoms at that time, um, what, what were they? So back then in school, I didn't stutter very, like I didn't stutter very often in front of people but because I was hiding it yes. so much. How, how, however, saying that, nearly everybody knew I, I did stutter. So, so clearly I wasn't hiding it that well. My, my main symptoms, if, if I was to get into an actual block, do you mean, or, or, or do you mean well, the covert tendencies? Well, did you tell? Well, no, the overt symptoms. Did you mainly block, or was it repetitions or prolongations? Oh, right. so. oh um, it, it, it was always repetitions. It's always been repetitions. Repetitions, okay. Ever since I remember, like maybe the odd prolongation. Very rarely did I silently block, because I think I just learned to push my way through everything. Okay, so you used to um, repeat, and you were also pushed, basically. Basically, yeah, I, I thought the only way to get through was pushing, even though it never worked. <laughs> okay. And yeah, so as, as I got older throughout school, it got worse and worse and worse. I, I chose engineering because it had the least amount of speaking involved. And then, yeah, I, I was just living the life of fear. There was so much fear constantly. 
We seem to have lost you there. I'm not sure if you can still hear me. Yeah. Uh, I w I remember my, my mum would say, oh, just just order a pizza on the phone and be filled with dread, like filled, so much anxiety. I would always avoid it. If I did muster up the courage, I would block on most of the words in the sentence and I, I, I would just be going P -p 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 pepperoni P -p 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 and just continue blocking with a high level of anxiety. And then I remember a, a few of the really bad instances where I, I couldn't really avoid. If I was to give a presentation or I had to say a certain thing, I, 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 I wouldn't really choose the option of, of avoidance then. I, I would say the words that I plan to say and just stutter through. So for example, at school and at uni, I, I had presentations to give and I would just soldier through them, but it, it was genuinely traumatic. Stuttering on most words, very long periods of time going c -c 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 could, uh, 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 sort of like that throughout the whole thing. People might laugh at school, uh, uni was a little bit better, but I was very, very ashamed of my speech. And yeah, generally my symptoms were lots of repetitions combined with a lot of avoidance. And throughout that period, you were having therapy of some sort or other, I believe. So kind of, and I was about 15, I, I I was having a little bit of private speech therapy that, that, that my mum paid for. How, however, I just wasn't ready to accept the fact that I started really. Um, the, the therapist taught me things like cancellations, pullouts, easy onset, stuff like that. How, however, there was one positive experience during that therapy session. So I told the therapist, I'm terrified of saying my name. I used to, I, I could never say my name. I never had said it fluently. So so the the, the therapist used used front sessions in her in her house. So out of the blue, she just she said, "Okay, wait here." And and she she went to the other room and brought her daughter out. And then she said, "Introduce yourself." I I, 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 I couldn't I couldn't believe she did that. First of all, she didn't really check in with me if that was okay, but fair enough. But interestingly enough, in, in, in the safe environment of the therapy room, I, I was able to say Sanjog fluently. Mm. So, so that was a very important experience for me, I think. Right. OK. And then you carried on with that therapy for some time or? No, I mean, yeah, for a few weeks, but I, I didn't implement anything because I wasn't ready. I did a bit of NHS therapy, which involved lots of group activities, playing games, but yeah, sure. In, in the room, I, I felt kind of comfortable, but it, it didn't change anything. Then after that really bad uni experience, I joined the Maguire program. Which was the first time I really saw change. Um, would, would, would you like more information about that? Yes, please. So. I had a really bad presentation and it was probably one of the lowest points of my life. And I thought, right, I need to do something here. I, I need to because I, I just couldn't continue living, stammering on every word. And, and, and that was actually the, the, the first day I really made a decision that I was going to do whatever it took to right. either have control or just stop stuttering. So I, I Googled intensive therapy, speech therapy, found Maguire, didn't really look it up. I just booked it. I went and yeah. It, it just wasn't what I expected at all. So, so, so I, I went in with the with the idea that oh, I'm, I'm going to fix my speech, I'll be cured. But, but from the, the very beginning, the Maguire program was telling me this isn't a cure. You, you, you will be able to manage your speech, but this is not a cure. And you will actually have to show people that you have a stutter. So this was very alien to me, very foreign. They they taught me things like costal breathing, um, di different versions of the cancellations, pullouts, and easy onset. R other than those, they they still use cancellation, but the, the, they call their version of the pullout the hit and hold, and it's a, a, a little bit more aggressive. 
it, it might sound a little bit like this, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, he also taught me this thing called a block release where you let go of tension and then try the word again, which again, I'd never even thought of doing. I'd always just pushed. Mm. They, they also teach deliberate disfluency or voluntary stammering, which was very, very, very helpful for my mindset. And when we went out on the street, mm. spoke to hundreds of people while I was stammering on purpose. And I, I really saw that there was no problem. People didn't seem to care if I was stuttering. Mm. So, by the end of the, 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 the four days, I was able to do a public speech in a busy, crowded square. I, I, I was able to say my name in Starbucks, all, all this good stuff. And I thought my problems were fixed forever. I went home, like skipping home, speaking to anyone I could see. I remember on the journey home, I had an hour conversation with this guy next to me on the, uh, in the train, which I never would have been able to do. Suddenly, I found myself able to order pizzas on the phone. It was amazing. Then, sadly, over the space of about a, one to two years, I noticed that it was becoming harder and harder and harder to remain in control. Mm. I, I was still able to use the technique, the costal breathing, with people I knew, but it was getting much more difficult with strangers and it, it would totally fall apart in high pressure situations. So, so I continued trying that on and off for the next, honestly, like four years. Yeah. But, but to, to cut a long story short, I, I put in 110% efforts and I just kept relapsing. And, and that happened maybe five times where just nothing was working. So I abandoned all the techniques. I'd, I'd, I'd had enough of technique, Bill, and, the, and I've tried a, a lot of other therapies. People like Tim Maxey, the Brocker brothers, Olga Bernaski. I, I tried working with Lee Lovett. Um, I, I worked with this guy called Jeffrey Gurian. I'm just trying to think. I'm, I'm sure there's plenty more. I, I work with all these people and I, I learn different things from them, but nothing. Oh, I also work with Chase Gillis. Mm. I tried all these things and sure, some of them helped with a bit of the mindset or they helped me understand things, but none stick, stuck. Nothing seemed to address the root cause from what I was seeing. And yeah, I, I, I basically had so so. From the 2015 journey of me joining Maguire to 2022, I, I pretty much had seven years of trying and failing, trying and relapsing. And I was in, in quite a desperate situation when I discovered the jump. OK, good. So, so that's a bit of the background of your therapy experiences. And then you came across the jump. Um, can you tell me how that happened? Somebody introduced you to it or? I'm trying to think back now. So I think the first time I really heard about you was was when I was reading Lee Lovett's stuttering book. Right. Because 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 you, you've written a foreword in, in in that book. So after I had tried Lee's approach two or three times and it didn't seem to have the intended effect on me, Plus, I, I, I didn't really want to avoid stuttering like Lee teaches. Mm. But, but I read your foreword and, and it sounded like your approach was a little bit different in that it advocated a bit of non-avoidance. So I Googled your name, like for Brock or her stuttering, and I found about the jump, read the whole page, and what, what I read, A, made sense to me, B, I liked that it, there was no avoidance really involved, and C, it, it seemed to tackle the, the root causes of just addressing the fear on words. And D, I, I really liked how there was no technique, nothing. You just speak and then you jump onto the next sound. OK, so and then once you got the idea of what the jump was, uh, did you try to put it into action by yourself? 
So this this is interesting. For for the first two months, I didn't actually put it into practice. I, I just kept reading about it because because I was still currently doing a um, a a uttering therapy which involves using a breathing technique. This did this, this like me ha having said, oh, I'm never gonna use a technique again. My speech was so bad with that one. I I I, I do one last ditch attempt at using a speech therapy technique. So I, I worked with a guy called Guy Monroe. He's an, another guy that I work with. But, but while I was working with him, uh, I, I noticed that I had a placebo response with the technique, as I always do. But that then the technique basically just wasn't working. And, and, and it, was, it was creating more tension within me than, than it was helping me with. So to, for the last two months of his, Therapy. I remember I just kept reading the jump and it, it was making more and more sense to me. So that, that's when eventually I, I told Guy that I'm, I'm not going to pursue that anymore. And I knew that I had to give the jump a real go before committing to just living a life by, by a technique. Right, right. OK, so after two months of finally having your last experiences of attempting to employ a, a technique that's when you started yeah yeah that that's when i began I, I think it was maybe october of last year 2022 mm. i i stopped I, I i tried it a few times but i wasn't sure if i was quite doing it correctly so i i, I sent you an email and then we got in touch yes yeah. so so it was indeed it was october last year when I, I received an email from you um, and I think we had a, a conversation shortly after that um, and from that time onwards I think you've been trying to employ it yeah yeah hope 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 really I've been trying to employ it quite successfully <laughs> but yeah pretty much since then I have attempted to jump on like 90 percent of my blocks i'd say actually perhaps at this point i should say i'll just give a little bit of explanation uh, of the main thing that the jump involves uh, so l like you pointed out sand jogs the key uh, thing to get right first of all is that it, it's not really a technique but it's um, if anything it's a non-technique it's mm. simply when you find yourself getting stuck, instead of trying to speak in a different way or anything like that, it's simply a matter of accepting that you're stuck uh, and effectively giving up trying to say the sound that you're finding that you can't say and moving straight on to the next sound. So effectively what you do is you jump over the sound you can't say and you move on to the next sound that you can say. So in, in that respect, it's, it's a way of getting started again that involves complete acceptance of your inability at that moment to say the particular sound that you're stuck on. Um, so yes, you, you started to try to put this into practice in your everyday life. Um, and how did it go for you? Yeah, so initially I, I realized that there was no way i was going to be be able to jump in for example talking to a stranger successfully really because i i really had to come to terms with the fact that my speech was pretty bad like because because i've been trying all these speech techniques which would mask the problem for a bit and i'd be like oh look i i i, I can speak pretty well if i take a big breath but but no, that's not how my real speech was. I really had to come to terms with the fact that I was blocking on every sound in the alphabet. That's not even, not even an exaggeration. Every sound was feared. I had so many feared words. So I knew that I had to start in the easiest situation, pos situation possible and take small steps, which is the opposite approach of Maguire, which is like go to the hardest situation and just maintain that, which didn't work. So I, I, I just decided to take the opposite approach here, which definitely worked a lot better. So my easiest situations were voice notes. Yes. 
even when I was using a breeding technique, I'd always find voice notes so easy. How, however, when I wasn't using any techniques, I'd still stutter a lot on voice notes. So, so I knew that uh, voice notes carried the least amount of pressure because worst comes to worst, you, you can just delete it, right? Like no one's forcing you to send that. So I, I started sending them to you quite a lot <laughs> and, and I, I, I feel bad for you because you had to listen to all of them. <laughs> but but I, I probably sent you at least three a day, at least, probably more like 10. Uh, yeah. And I would keep doing it. And really, I, I, I didn't see much progress in terms of physical symptoms for a long time. I remember a, a few weeks in, I, I was having a conversation with, with you and, and um, I, I was saying, yeah, my, my, my levels of tension have decreased. I'm able to move forward, but the frequency of my blocks hasn't changed. And, mm. and, and, and you, you were saying that, that, that you, you were hoping that if, you, if, if I continue to do it, that the frequency would diminish. So that, that kind of kept me going a little bit. And I thought, let me give this three months. So I focused on voice notes to you and my family, sometimes my friends, depending on how brave I was feeling. Right, OK, so that's interesting to me because, uh, of, of course, like you said, you started sending these voice notes and I personally have never used voice notes before. So this was a bit of a new experience for me. I wasn't aware at the time that the reason that you were sending them or and the reason that you had been using them previously was because you found that it, it was a relatively easy situation for you uh, to speak. Um, but that was something that I gradually realised, um, and we'll come back to this a bit later on, but it sort of dawned on me that actually using voice notes is in fact a very good way of getting into the jump in, in the early stages. Uh, because I think maybe for a lot of people who are trying just trying to start off using the jump, uh, using it in real life conversations is a bit overwhelming. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there's a tendency in such situations to panic. And of course, when you panic, then it all goes out of the window. Whereas with the voice notes, because you've got that much more control and it, if you really need to, you can cancel it and do it again. Um, it, there's much less pressure there. And so, yeah, it, it became evident to me that that was actually really a good way in. Mm -hmm. So, yes, yeah, so um, you found that when you were doing the jump with these voice notes, that uh, the amount of tension reduced quite substantially. Mm -hmm. uh, but the actual frequency of the blocks didn't reduce, first of all. That's, that's what he was saying. And okay, okay, so where did we go from there? Um, yeah, do you remember? Yeah, I, yeah, it, it wasn't too long ago. It was it, like it, it, it's, it's funny because it feels like a different life, but it was only three months ago, four months ago. Mm. So, like you said, I noticed that my tension had gone down. One of the one of my issues I was having when people were telling me to use breathing techniques. A, a, I noticed that I was feeling anxious even thinking about inhaling sharply after a while. And 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 e even the act of inhaling would, would cause me to freeze during the breath. So it, it would be something like, and, and I'd be struggling to inhale. Plus, I would have so much tension in my shoulders from taking the breath in because I was clearly tensing everything up. So immediately I knew that this wasn't the solution for me because it seemed like the breathing was just making me so tense. OK, so could I just ask the, the breathing techniques you're talking about are the techniques that you learned, for example, in the Maguire or, or with some of the other people that you've seen? Yeah, yeah. But were, were, were you still using them a little bit when you started using the jump? Were you still taking that sort of in breath when you first started or or not? Uh, no, no. Uh, no, as as soon as, as I decided to switch over to the jump, I just abandoned everything because okay. I was I, I knew that I wanted to tackle the root cause, and I I also knew that none of my fluent friends thought about their breathing, so I just it just didn't make sense to me anymore to focus on. Right. Okay. So maybe that's a good moment for me to just mention uh, that one of the principles behind the jump, and it's quite an important one 
in order to employ it, um, first of all, when one starts speaking, one actually doesn't use any technique whatsoever. One just speaks spontaneously um, without any special breathing or without slowing down or speeding up or anything, just like one would if one didn't stutter. And one carries on like that until one gets stuck. And then um, you can employ the jump. And, and so one of the things I found quite difficult to uh, get across to people who are first starting off on the jump, because the reality is that almost everybody who comes has already had speech therapy and has already uh, learned a variety of different techniques. Um, and m almost invariably, the techniques that they've learned are sorts of avoidance. Um, so, so they're, they're given a positive spin uh, because they're, they're techniques to help you manage your stuttering, but the, the reality is they're helping you avoid the stuttering. And so one of the things that I ask of people when they first start doing the jump is, is that they ditch all of their techniques and, and they just speak spontaneously. Um, of course, after years and years of using techniques, it, it can be a very difficult thing to do to just not use them uh, but it, it's an important prerequisite to that one of the things that you've already mentioned actually and this is an experience i had uh, in my earlier life um, because i also had ongoing speech therapy from different uh, therapists um, sometimes especially if i was impressed with a therapist or impressed with a therapy um, my stuttering would improve dramatically. Mm. Um, and sometimes it would improve very, very quickly too, almost too quick to be true. Um, and that improvement would then last a few weeks and then gradually it would start to fall apart. And, and, and then as time went on, I gradually sink back to the state that I was in before I'd started. And, and then I, I used to find that if I continued trying to use the, the techniques that they taught me, that they no longer worked. Uh, so, so you mentioned yourself this placebo effect, which is very common when, when people who stutter go uh, for stuttering therapy. Um, now, I know because we've discussed this quite a bit, that in the early stages, uh, when you were first experimenting with the jump and you did start to find that it was helping you, uh, this was at the back of your mind all of the time, I think, the possibility that it, it might wear off, it, that it might just be a placebo. Yeah, yeah. And to be honest, it still creeps up, even though it's nearly six months and it just continues to work. But uh, it, it is uh, worth mentioning that when I first started jumping, I, I did also experience a placebo for about a, a week or two. Mm -hmm. How, how, however, I was expecting a placebo because it happened so many times. So I, I, I didn't let, let it phase me as much because, because I, I remember I had a phone call with you, mm -hmm. maybe a week or two in, and and I, I was able to jump very well. Yes, it, it, it was simply placebo, and 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 then I had another phone call with you weeks later. It, it was much harder to jump for me and I was experiencing loads more anxiety. So, mm -hmm. so I said that was a nice reminder that the, well, not so nice reminder that the first exp experience was just a placebo. Yeah. But so, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so again, this is a common experience also with people practicing the jump The the first week into it, they, they find it works beautifully uh, and it's sort of interesting because sometimes if, if I do manage to see them live or, or over Skype or something like that, I, I, uh, they'll tell me how well they've or how much it's helped them. And, and yet when I'm watching, I'm noticing that they're, as often as not, they're not actually jumping in the way that um, it's supposed to be done. Um, and then a few weeks, well, a week or two or more later, then it, it starts to become more difficult. It starts to fall apart uh, and a proportion of them disappear then and don't come back. <laughs> okay. uh, but 
but some people hang on and, and stick with it. Uh, and, and so what I'm saying here is that, yes, with this technique, it's very common to start off with a placebo effect, which can give you a false sense of security. Uh, and, and you can get that before you've started the hard work of actually really learning how to do the jump uh, in the way that it's intended. Um, so I think that did happen with you, uh, but you you kept at it. Yeah, and it's worth just mentioning now that I I, I didn't know how to do the jump properly. I, I watched a video of you reading, and I remember thinking that sounds too weird because because it was the, the 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 proper hardcore jumps as I call it. Where so so for example, if if you would who jump, it, it would sound like I've just done on those two words, yeah. like a proper break and you jump onto the next sound. But I remember listening to you doing it, I was like, that's too weird. Let, let me just do my own hybrid version. So, so I was, <laughs> because I had the placebo under my belt, I, 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 I was kind of just still connecting the first two sounds, but I was sort of jumping, which worked for a couple of weeks and then basically crumbled. And I had to uh, annoyingly accept that I had to sound a bit weird and <laughs> do the jump properly. Mm. But but it's it's worth saying again saying again that it doesn't actually sound weird. It only sounded weird to me. And something another reason why voice notes are really good is because you can listen back to yourself, which mm -hmm. I hadn't really done. I hated when I vlogged. But what I was noticing when I was jumping was that during the jump, I, I felt like the gap between the first and second sound was an eternity. And I also thought this sounds so weird and mangled. The word doesn't sound right. But and I, I listened back to the voice recording from a almost like a third party perspective, not in it with all the heightened emotions. When I listened back in the third party perspective, it sounded fine. I, you could easily understand the word the, the the gap was a fraction of a second compared to what I thought it was. So th that was when I started realizing that my perceived reality was just not the truth. And, and, and that really helped me to slowly overcome any fears about sounding weird or fears about uh, people not understanding. Because to this day, 99% of what I've said while while having jumped has been understood, even when I think it's not going to be understood, even when I've jumped over two sounds, even when I think there's no way this person will get it, they always do, which which shows how faulty my perception of the world was. Yeah, um, uh, that's a really important point, I think. And and again, it's, it's an experience that's been shared by other people who have learned the jump where from a subjective perspective, um, when one's jumping, one, one feels that um, it's really weird, it, that, and one thinks that it sounds weird. I mean, from one's own auditory feedback, it seems to sound weird, and it seems like the gap in between the sounds that you're giving up on and the next sound that you're jumping onto uh, is very long, when in fact it's not so long at all. And one of the main reasons people have difficulty employing the jump uh, or difficulty summoning up the courage to actually employ it in real life situations is because they think the listener will find it weird and they also don't think the listener will understand them. Mm -hmm. um, and those two thoughts are, are, are quite major obstacles, actually. One has to get beyond that. And yes, you're quite right. It's turned out that recording yourself whether it be a voice message or whether it be a video or whatever, um, is a great way of overcoming those false beliefs uh, that you you record yourself. While you're recording yourself, it feels really weird and you think it's taking ages. And then when you play it back, you re you realise that it's not half as bad as what it sounded. And, and it's perfectly understandable as often as not. Mm. I say as often as not, it's not always understandable. It's not a perfect solution, uh, but but more often than not. Mm. Yes. Now, um, 
So you were saying also about how you you decided you were go going to do a hybrid version, and and what that hybrid version really involved was you would allow yourself to get stuck, and then almost straight away you would say the you would jump to the next sound without fully letting go of the sound you were stuck on. Yes, is, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, for example. Um, if, if I was to block on the word hi, hi, my, not the word, the sentence. Hi, my name is Sanjog. Let's 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 say that my name is the feared word there. Mm -hmm. So rather than doing a proper jump, which would be hi, my name is Anjog. Mm -hmm. Rather than doing that, I'd be like hi, 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 my name is Anjog, and and, and it was almost still connected a, a little bit, and yeah. it, it, it didn't quite have the letting go, and oftentimes I just it'll be repeating the first sound quite a few times because I wasn't really aware of when the block began and when my pushing began. Yes, yeah. Yes, we'll come back to that because that, that's mm. something I also want to discuss. Uh, but uh, the experience of jumping and the experience, well, the experience of jumping properly uh, with a proper break between the, the two parts and and the experience of the hybrid jump as you called it which which is like not quite letting go and and restarting almost immediately um one thing that i found uh when i first started doing it because i did the same as you yeah i mean i i, I was keen to get the jumps over as quickly as possible <laughs> yeah. um, so that they would sound the least weird that they could possibly sound but <laughs> But what I found was that if I jumped properly and really let go and then restarted, every time I did that, I could actually feel a sort of relaxation happening in my body. It was like everything became less tense and noticeably less tense, just doing it one or two, maybe three times. Whereas if I did those pseudo jumps, yeah. That that relaxation effect didn't seem to happen in the same way. Um, is that anything like the experience that you went through? Yeah, I've I've had the exact same experience, <clears throat> and and e even on, on the, his call, I've been doing well, some of my jumps have been proper, but but I I I, I hey, a, a lot of the ones I've been doing on this call have been towards the the hybrid end. It's been interesting because, like you said, I, I haven't really had that relaxation. But as soon as I did a couple of proper ones, I just immediately relaxed. And I personally think the reason is because when you're really letting go, like I, 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 I just had a real block on when then, and I let go and jumped, and immediately I relaxed. But I think the reason it works is because when you do that, you're fully accepting that you can't say this sound and you're accepting it could sound weird and you're accepting that you could come across as different from everybody else that's why you immediately relax but because you're no longer trying to sound fluent or trying not to stutter you've accepted you've stuttered and you've also done something that could be seen as weird so that immediately i think uh, puts you into a state of acceptance and non-resistance which which is why you're Super relaxed afterwards. Yeah, well, that that makes sense, and I think that's probably a valid exp explanation. Um, you and I have both had the same experience, though that that um, the desire <laughs> to make the jumps as as short as possible and the desire to link up the sounds still remains. And and so what what I experience when I'm having to talk a lot is that my tendency is is to do more pseudo jumps or whatever we call them uh, they're, they're not really proper jumps and i'll continue doing that and it and they work yeah they they get me they keep me moving forward um and they work but they don't relax me and mm. then i gradually get tenser and tenser <laughs> and i start noticing that my blocks are becoming more of a problem and then at some point in the conversation, I, I decide, OK, I've got to do some <laughs> yeah. now. Um, and then all of a sudden it all relaxes again and, and I can talk again. But of course, then when it all gets easier, the temptation comes back. <laughs> so, so one goes around and around in this sort of circle. 
Yeah. Uh, but that's okay. I mean, I've got accustomed to the fact that that's how it works. Um, and over the years, because now I've been doing it for quite a few years, I um, the tension doesn't mount up like it used to. Um, and so, yes, I find that actually I can get away with my pseudo jumps now much more successfully than I could at an earlier age or, or when I first started doing it. That, that's the, 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 the dream, being able to <laughs> pretend you flew it. No, I'm joking. Um, it, I've had the exact same experience, though. Um, as soon as I have would have given up because the, the reason you, you want to do a pseudo jump is because you want to sound fluent really like a deep down and and then maybe because you're trying to be fluent then which is a an unnatural intention for speaking anyway people don't think about if they're fluent or not but because that's happening the tension is mounting and then if eventually you get to a point where you just give up you're like, okay fine i'm going to block now i may as well do a proper jump and as soon as you do that everything's fine after one, two, or max three. And it, it is remarkable how quickly the fear drops. Mm, yeah, really. Um, OK, so so that's gone through some of the bits that I really wanted to highlight. There's just one other bit that, that I do want to highlight about the jump. And this is this issue um, about not wanting to block. Mm. Now, a key thing in order to be able to employ the jump, you have to let yourself block. And this is one of the big stumbling blocks for people who are trying to start using the, uh, the, the jump because almost invariably people don't want to block. They see blocking as a failure or they see it as a bad thing. And, and their idea when they go for therapy is that the therapy will reduce the amount that they block. Um, and it's true also that I tell people that when they learn to jump, gradually as time goes on, the amount that they block will reduce. Uh, but but that's a long term thing and it, yeah. it doesn't happen early on. So the first thing that happens is that uh, speech becomes easier. Uh, that it's not so it doesn't make you tense up so much and you find you can keep on moving forward without any difficulty and, and people uh, do get your messages across better. Uh, but the blocks continue. It's just that the blocks become shorter. Uh, now, how have you found it? Uh, be be because I know that in the beginning, um, you were also not wanting to block, yeah? Yeah, I mean, I, I think everyone, most people that stutter don't want to block. <laughs> that, that's part of the reason they're still stuttering. <laughs> they, they really hate blocking. Um, when I first started, it the jump did not impact the frequency of my blocks at all. So I was blocking so much. But I, I even noticed that well, when I was doing voice notes to you, there were two experiences I could have. The, the, the first experience is where I was just speaking, but I didn't want to stutter really. Mm -hmm. and, and each time I blocked, it, 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 it didn't feel very good. However, I was still able to execute the jump pretty well, but but it didn't feel good and it felt a little bit more effortful, I guess. Mm -hmm. And the second experience is, and you have the mindset, I want to block because I want to jump over the sound so that I can reduce the fear in my subconscious, which means in the long term, I will become more fluent. And, and, and I had the I want to block mindset, each block, what was was great oh well, wow this is great i can block i can jump i can block i can jump and and then and the more blocks the, the better really because it, it was the, the way i viewed it, it it was like i was chipping away at the fear each time i was blocking i was just chipping away chipping away chipping away and and i i, I knew that i had a massive feared feared word wall but but i viewed it like i was chipping away like half a brick at a time or something rather than the, the the first viewpoint, which is, oh my God, I don't want to block and I'm, I'm just using the jump to be fluent. Yeah, sure. So so the blocks, you came to perceive the blocks as opportunities, basically, mm. as opportunities to chip away at the fears. Uh, so, so 
every time you blocked on on a particular word and then you successfully jumped um the fear of blocking on that word or in in that situation would reduce proportionally and and that that's certainly how the theory of it is and and it seems like your experiences back back that up yeah. uh, so so do you still find that you don't want to jump <laughs> uh, no sorry uh, that you don't want to block <laughs> or yeah yeah <clears throat> even to this day i'll so, so what normally happens is i i'll, I'll go through a cycle of <clears throat> totally accepting that i stutter and each block is an opportunity for me to jump I'll, I'll, I'll go through that phase with everybody that i speak to and i feel at ease and as a result my speech becomes more and more fluent over a few days it, 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 it gets to the point where i'm pretty much not thinking about speaking with with, with easier situations <clears throat> So, so as, as a result of less control over my speech, I feel like it's coming out more naturally, i.e. I, less blocking anyway. Then I realise I'm speaking fluently for a few days and I, I want to continue speaking fluently. So then is the strong tendency for if there's a, a bit of fear creeping in on a word, there's a tendency to want to like just you use a pseudo jump or or e e e even some, some kind of filler word in front of the the fear but of course if that happens then the fear quickly builds and i start blocking more and i'm using my pseudo jumps as pseudo jumps but like you said earlier that tension kind of builds and builds in which case my my fluency castle comes crumbling down and <laughs> Not, not completely crumbles, by the way, but, but but some blocking returns and I go back to proper jumps, which quickly enables me to get to a good place again. I, 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 I do, I do you just want to say that, that I'm, I'm, I'm not fluent in all situations or anything. I'm, I'm still very much on the journey, but but the progress I've made from October to now has been quite remarkable, I'd say. And I'm now in a place where I can hold a a, a, a decent conversation one on one with pretty much anybody. I'd say my my more difficult situations currently are initiating with a stranger or speaking in a very very loud loud group environment, plus talking to groups. But but everything else. Really, it, 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 it hasn't caused me anywhere near the amount of fear, anywhere near the amount of fear that I would have had back in October. Since you started practicing the jump, um, the, the amount of fear of stuttering and of uh, getting stuck in most speaking situations has reduced quite substantially. Um, and as you say, there are certain speaking situations that, that you really find pretty easy now, uh, whereas yeah. there are other ones that are a bit more more difficult still. Um, so this fear, it's one thing I've observed with you is that you also seem to go through a cycle of, of experiencing quite a bit of confidence yeah. and then all, all, <laughs> all of a sudden starting to doubt. Yeah, um, and I call these crises of confidence, uh, which, which seem to come in a sort of cyclical way. Uh, do you, would you like to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, I, I really like how you describe them as crises of confidence. I, I'd never heard that phrase before, but what, and you said it for the first time. I was like, yeah, that is exactly what it feels like. Because you're right, I, I go through this phase where. Per, 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 perhaps I'm not in that many difficult situations and I've been speaking a lot in my like end group talking on the phone whatever if it was comfortable and I'm super fluent I'm, oh yeah I've overcome stuttering like that I get that, that kind of vibe and I'm I got so much confidence that I do go into a more difficult situation expecting fluency and and for the most part in the beginning I do have fluency simply because I'm so confident. Then when the blocks start creeping in, um, it, it, it can cause me to 
to have a little dent in the confidence, especially if I'm kind of resisting using the jump. Then the fear builds up and I can kind of get a bit disheartened. What I've noticed, what I've noticed is that because of my past experiences with the Maguire program specifically, the, the, the number of times I relapsed on that program, I count <laughs> 10, I don't know, so many times I, I, I would put in so much effort, maybe have a, a month, two months of continued what seemed like better speech and then it would just come crashing down and nothing would just last. So I think I've got that imprinted in my subconscious somewhere because I keep having that fear like, oh my God, what if the jump wears off? What if it wears off? So anytime I'm in a really difficult situation, I start having those fears because from Maguire, I had this very unrealistic expectation that my speech should be the same in all situations. That's just not feasible or realistic and it's just not how it works with people who stutter uh, at least not yet I'm, I'm 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 hoping i i get to the stage one day where speech is fairly easy in all situations but currently i'm not quite there yet mm. and in in the more difficult ones when i do have a hard time and perhaps the jump feels quite difficult to do or people aren't understanding me as much in a very loud pub for example i i, I do leave it the situation thinking, oh man, that, that's the end of my fluency run. Maybe the jump's going to wear off now. Saying that, that experience has happened so many times now and I, I've i never had a, a relapse with the jump because the, a relapse implies that... So it, it's quite interesting but because a relapse implies that you, your speech re reverts to a previous level in all situations I assume but 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 the thing with the jump is that I have a pretty solid belief now that in my easier situations I've jumped so many times on words and sounds that there's been a permanent reduction in the fear and 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 and, and, and the only way to relapse in my easier situations is if I purposefully didn't jump and kept forcing and pushing and purposefully traumatizing myself which I, I obviously wouldn't do so the fear of relapse has has definitely diminished quite a lot. Uh, so if if I go and back to my own experiences, um, because again, you know, a similar sort of thing, I, I have a past history of having different forms of therapy, the therapy working for a time and then relapsing. One of the key experiences I had when I relapsed in the past was that when when the relapse happened, the therapy techniques didn't seem to work anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so whereas when I first started to employ the therapy techniques, they usually did work. When I lost confidence in them and I started relapsing, I, I do exactly the same things and they wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. And what was fundamentally different with the jump was was that the jump worked even when I didn't believe it would work. <laughs> um, and that is what really uh, made all of the difference to me because um, I would go through periods of fluency using the jump and then like you say, I'd, I'd put myself in a really difficult speaking situation and, and it would be more difficult and I'd start have, having doubts. But then, if, as soon as I employed the jump properly, I would find I could get going again and I, I could, uh, it, it didn't always feel very good straight away, mm -hmm. but the key thing was I could start moving forward and people would understand me and it, it, it would work again. And then I would relax and, and going through that experience, every time I went through that experience of expecting it all to fall apart and thinking this is the end, and then realizing that the, the, the jump, that I could still jump and it would still work. Um, those repeated experiences have um, seemed to have stopped my fear that I might relapse. And, and with me, the fear of relapse disappeared 
certainly within a year. Um, and I mean, it it sort of disappeared. I, I never actually physically felt the fear of relapse after I'd been practicing the jump for maybe a month or two. But but I, I had an intellectual fear that maybe it might relapse sometime. But, but then even that disappeared in the end. Um, and I think this goes back to what I was saying earlier, that, that strictly speaking, the jump isn't really a technique. It's, what it really is, it is a, a just a complete acceptance that there's certain sounds, when one finds oneself blocking on a sound, that one completely accepts that one can't say that sound at that moment of time and just moves on to whatever sound one can say. Um, and, and, and so one can't really go wrong with that. Or at least that's how I un understood it. Exactly, exactly. I think the reason why it works so well is because, like you said, there's no technique to really hone in on. Uh, I, I mean, maybe if you focused really in on the 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 actual act of jumping onto the sound, you you could could make it into a technique, right? I don't know, like best jump or something. But but really, it's just about abandoning the sound you can't say, pausing and restarting on the rest of the word. And it's, 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 it's never going to completely fail you because he, if you block on the next sound, you can just keep jumping. He, even if you have to miss out the whole word, the, 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 the jump hasn't failed you because it's still technically working because the steps are, if you block, jump. So, so if you have to miss out a word, you, you, you still technically employed the jump successfully. So the, the, the only way in, in my mind for the jump to not work is if, if in some mad world you, you start blocking on every sound in every sentence and you just can never jump, which obviously would never happen. Mm -hmm. Well, saying that, um, th that is one of the major fears that, that people have when they're practicing the jump. And uh, depending on how severe their stammering is, um, I, I have quite a few people come to me and say, well, I, I jump over the sound I can't say, then I, f I find I can't say the next sound either. Uh, but I find it harder to jump over the next sound because my expectation that the person's going to understand me goes down uh, because I, I'm afraid that I'm going to miss out so much of the word that the person won't understand. Um, I'm sure you've had that fear too, yeah? Um, but But what... Can you talk about that and, and how, how you've dealt with that? Yeah, I've definitely had that fear. Less so now, but in the beginning, I, I really had a distorted view of speech anyway. I I genuinely thought that if I j jumped just once, people wouldn't understand me. Mm. And, and if, God forbid, I had to jump on two sounds, not a chance. What again helped was listening to myself countless times on voice notes. That really helped with that fear. Um, when I had to block and employ the jump, I, I would consciously remind myself that remember this, how, how you're feeling now isn't how the listener's perceiving. Remember your voice notes. I, I would consistently and continuously remind myself that your per perception of what's going on is not the truth and what helped with the double sound skipping because because of higher voice now i didn't really ex experience it in in half tension where i'd have to, to jump on two sounds very often anyway what will really help with that is if it were to occur i i, I, I didn't beat myself up it it actually has happened on the word wouldn't then i blocked on the w and the o and kind of the u but, but, but could you understand me oh yeah it was completely understandable exactly right but 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 to me it, it felt weird I was like, oh i've blocked on three sounds here and like don't but people understand because it's understandable and oh something else that really helped with the, all these fears is realizing how little attention people pay to speaking. My old view, like the stuttering mindset, is people are hyper focused on every word I say and it needs to be perfect. But I basically, with, with some of the work I did with 
people like Barbara Darm, who's another person I, did, I didn't mention earlier, but um, she, she taught me what natural speech is and stuff like how fluent people speak. And, and, and what I learned was that people pay as much attention to speaking as they do with their breathing or, for example, their walking in, in, in most situations, which blew my mind, really, because obviously, as I'm sure you're aware, in your past, I was hyper analyzing, I was hyper focusing and my, my entire existence was, was based around not stuttering. Yeah. But as, as I continued to jump and, and, and sometimes I, I would feel brave enough to jump on two sounds. Um, sometimes I, I didn't feel that brave and I would kind of push. So I would jump onto the second sound and kind of push mm. and, and it would come out with more effort. Mm. But, but, but I didn't give myself a hard time with that. I, I thought I, I tried jumping, whatever, continue. But, but sometimes I felt brave enough to, to try and skip the next sound. And, and each time I did that, I never once had a listener say, what? They, they, they continued to understand me, despite my internal reality being, they're not going to understand me. Mm. So it was about challenging that belief, which had come from, I don't know, somewhere, and realizing that it just wasn't the truth. Yeah, so, so that's a very common false belief. Having said that, it is true that the listener doesn't always understand and there are situations where you will jump and, and the listener will say what? <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and then the other thing, uh, and I think this is equally important, is the realisation that actually, you know, it, it doesn't matter that much if mm. the listener doesn't understand straight away. Um, even with fluent speakers who don't stand, speakers who don't stammer, you know, the listeners don't always understand them either, but they just say it again or whatever. Um, one of the things I've tried to impress upon people doing the jump is the key thing is to keep moving forward to the end of the phrase, you know, and even if it seems like the listener isn't understanding you, keep moving forward anyway. Um, and so, so like your default, um, attitude should be that you presume the listener is going to, to understand you and then when you get to the end of the thing that you want to say the end of the phrase at least if it's really clear that the listener hasn't understood then go back and you can say the entire phrase again um, and say it the second time with a bit less effort rather than with more effort because like you said you know um, people who don't stammer, they, they put very little effort into speaking. And the effort make, is, is what really makes the stammering worse. And, and mm. of course, I think all of us have this habit of when we find that we've not been understood, we try harder to make ourselves understood. So we use more force, more tension, and the stutter normally gets worse. But actually, if, if you've already gone through the phrase once and maybe the listener hasn't understood the key words and, and that's usually the thing because it's the key words we're most likely to stutter on um, nevertheless the listener will have heard a fair bit of it and un un understood a fair bit of it so when you do go back and you do it the second time uh, the listener's already got a vague idea of what you're trying to say so the chances of the listener understanding goes up quite considerably anyway uh, and the trick the second time round, be even more lazy about it and, and put less effort into it um, and focus on the flow. You know, the, this is one of the things Barbara Dahm and I, I guess, have in common is, is the importance of the flow, that, that when one's speaking, uh, the ease with which the listeners are able to pay attention to us and to understand us it is not so much the perfection of each individual word, but much more the flow of the phrase as a whole. Um, and so, yeah, that's, the jump is not a perfect solution all of the time, uh, but when one experiences that, that it's not working, it's not the end of the world. One, one can always go back and, and then do all of that. Definitely. And uh, there are a couple of things I wanted to add. One being 
something else that helped me with the fear of not being perceived not not well the for, from the from the fear of not of the listener not understanding me was that sometimes I would jump in 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 a voice note to you or somebody and i'd listen back and and this did this i mean knowing that i had jumped and just restarted on the second half of the word let's let's say i'm um i'm, I'm trying to say the word water as wa mm. water did, did despite me knowing i had jumped my brain would fill in the blanks so so for example if the sentence is i want a cup of water here's here's how i i would have said it I want a cup of water. Here's how my brain heard it. I I I, I want a cup of water. I mm -hmm. genuinely heard the W after the jump, even though I knew a hundred percent I hadn't said it. So so yeah. that helped because I realised if I can hallucinate that despite knowing it's not there, then I'm sure all my listeners are, are, are going to fill in the blanks for me way more than I would do despite knowing it right so so that helped reduce the fear quite a bit as well yes and and that's exactly what happens uh, i mean there's there's been a pile of psycholinguistic research into how listeners perceive things and and yeah their their brains really do fill in the blanks i mean i, I had a similar experience when i was um uh recording the videos demonstrating to people how to jump <laughs> um, and I was doing the jumps properly, uh, so so I was um, stopping, and, and there was a gap, and and then I start on the next sound. Uh, never start by repeating the sound that I've been stuck on. And yet, when I listened to the videos, I thought, "Hang on a minute, I'm <laughs> I'm repeating the sound." <laughs> um, and, and I'm saying the word in its entirety. Uh, and then I was thinking, but no, I really didn't say the word in its entirety. I missed out the first sound. And and yeah, it was my brain that was filling in that sound. Mm. Uh, so, uh, and it's an important thing to realize that, yes, listeners do do that. And so it, it really is much easier for them to understand that it doesn't sound half as weird as we think it does. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, just one Final thing, prob probably a final thing anyway. <laughs> um, I want us to ask or to discuss a little bit about the mindset of when we use the jump. Um, to my mind, it's not necessary to use it perfectly every time. Um, it's something that What's maybe more important is the way we approach speaking, the the, the sort of un, underlying motivation that we have when we go into a conversation or some something like that. What has been your experience over these past months with the importance of the mindset in that regard? Yeah. So so the way I'm interpreting the question, um, my answer is what what i quickly noticed is that my only intention for speaking pre-jump was to not stutter and it was to be fluent which i quickly realized was a really weird intention to have like if, if i were to ask any of my fluent friends hey what's your intention for speaking being fluent wouldn't even be an idea it's it's so alien they're like what do you mean be fluent? you know this speaking speak it yeah it it it, 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 it would be like breathing with the intention to breathe fluent, like breathe fluently or breathe smoothly. Mm. What? You don't think it just happens. And and interestingly enough, if if you did have the intention to breathe smoothly, you'd you'd you probably wouldn't breathe very smoothly because you'd be consciously controlling it too much. Yes. So I quickly realised that, and I tried to abandon that. And and, and my mindset for going into speaking situations were. I, I, I didn't want to practice the jump because that's a weird intention too. Mm. I just wanted to, to go about my life and speak as much as I could to people that I actually wanted to speak to, say the things I wanted to say uh, with, with, within reason. So uh, another mindset I had was take small steps. Mm. So rather than going straight and 
trying to speak to like a, a, a group of 10 attractive women, for example, the nightmare situation for some. I, I, I started off speaking as to my friends, but, but actually saying the things I wanted to and not avoiding because mm. because even the concept of avoidance is kind of alien as well, isn't it? But of, of course, we have lots of fears. Mm-hmm. So the, 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 the mindset was just speak normally and if you block use the jump with the the mindset as well of blocking is a good thing because if you block you can use the jump which means you're reducing the fear on that word sound or situation in your subconscious you're you're chipping away at the fear so blocking is a good thing I, i think those two mindsets are pretty pretty key for how you progress in in terms of doing the jump perfectly yeah but that's actually less important than i realized because in in the, in the beginning i was pretty hell bent on trying to do perfect jumps but i realized it, it it didn't make as much difference as just moving forward does and the 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 less you're paying attention to these feared words or blocks you're having the the better it is generally mm-hmm. so in the forward flow over everything else is probably another good mindset to have yes yeah sure I, and I, I would agree with that totally um, another issue and, and this is sort of related to uh, mindset but it's it's how one goes about starting to use the jump in real life situations the extent to which one should purposefully create speaking situations in order to practice jumping. Um, Mm -hmm. I'll I'll say what I think uh, to to start with, because I've I've experimented a bit um, with different approaches. And my where what I've arrived at now is is a a feeling that uh, it's not necessarily a good thing to be hell bent on practicing it and hell bent mm. on creating speaking situations with the sole purpose of being able to practice jumping. Um, and the reason I say that is is because I found that often the listener realizes that, that that when you go and talk to them in that way, that you're not really talking to them, that you're actually practicing a technique and and then it's a rather artificial situation. It's not real. It's not really a real life situation at all. Um, having said that, one does need to get a bit of experience using it, and one does need to to somehow find a way of actually getting that experience. Uh, so, so I think it's a bit of charting a middle way between the two extremes. Um, mm. What approach have you taken? Uh, in in terms of getting experience with using the jump i was just thinking about it and i've actually not made a phone call i just realized because because i was thinking back to Maguire and i, I probably made like five thousand plus phone calls literally just ringing up saying sandra sandy speaking i'd like to book a double just countless hotels i would ring or even calling a hotel and saying, hi, uh, do, do you have a reservation under the name of San Sandu, just to practice my name? It didn't help at all. <laughs> yeah, during the call, I was able to overkill the fear. But then when when Joe down the street was like, what's your name? I was like, panicking. It didn't, you know. And I was just thinking if I did any practice with the jump. And not really. Eve, and when I was sending you voice notes, I was still speaking things that I wanted to say to you. For example, here's here's what I've had difficulty with today. This mm. is what my experience has been. I, I never really was just seeing if I was jumping properly, you know? That's, that's an, an another thing I want to say is that it's all well and good to practice things, but I don't think this is one of them. <laughs> like speaking shouldn't be something that needs practice. You 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 were you were speaking as a baby without any practice. Okay 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 yeah, learning to speak you're practicing, but 
once you could speak, you didn't really practice and you were you were speaking fluently until you began stuttering, right? So, so my my view was always, I know how to speak. I, I, I've just added on layers and layers and layers of complications and control and fears and hesitations. But, but I, I always believe that what I wanted to get out of all of this is use the jump, reduce the fear on all these words, it eventually switch back, back over to a more natural, fluent mind as well. Not just fluent speech, it, it's thinking like everybody else does. Mm. And, and that, that's one of the things that really attracted me to the jump. Because I remember when I phoned you for the first time, one of my first questions was, how much do you think about your speech? And, and your answer was very rarely. And, and, and that pretty much gave me all the information I needed because every other therapy, it seemed like people were just thinking about speaking all day long and that's no way to live life. No, 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 that, that's a real burden. Okay, I, I think we've pretty much got to the end of the agenda now. Um, so, I'd like to thank you uh, for volunteering uh, to take part in this and, and um, maybe sometime in the future we'll do a little bit more um, and a, a bit of an update. Uh, okay, so we'll leave it there for now. Thank cool. you very much. Thanks for having me on and I, 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 I think it would be quite cool to do a similar interview maybe after a year and two years and just compare sure yes yes i'll put it in the diary okay <laughs> thanks paul bye, bye.